Hello everyone. I'm Masaki Kimura from Hitachi Plantara. I'm going to talk about connectivity between legacy systems and Kubernetes. Identifying senders by using source IPs. First, let me briefly introduce myself. My name is Masaki Kimura. My GitHub handle is mkimuram. I'm an OSS developer in Hitachi Pantara. I have been contributing to communities around Kubernetes for more than three years. I'm one of the main developers to make raw block boarding features and CSI features stable. I'm recently working on implementing enhancement for communication between Kubernetes cluster and outside cluster and proposing protection feature for Kubernetes resources. And this session is about communication between Kubernetes cluster and outside cluster. To begin with, let me quickly share the overview of this session. Almost all organizations, if they have IT systems, they have systems on-premise and or in clouds. They may start applying Kubernetes to transition to cloud-native world. So they will deploy Kubernetes on-premise and or in clouds. Usually, all the existing system won't migrate to Kubernetes at once, some of them may eventually lift and shift to Kubernetes, but not all of them. Systems in existing environment and systems in Kubernetes clusters coexist at least for a certain amount of time. So if there are any interactions between existing systems and Kubernetes clusters, network connectivity between them is required. There will be some connectivity related issues, but in this session, I will focus on only one of them. Let me explain about it. Some legacy systems require that they can identify senders by using source IPs. In other words, they detect who send packets by source IPs of the packets. On the other hand, Kubernetes specification doesn't define source IPs from Kubernetes cluster to be unique and stable ones. So, we are not sure which IP address are set as source IPs when receiving from packets from Kubernetes cluster. As a result, legacy requirement of identifying senders by using source IPs and Kubernetes specification of unstable source IPs conflict when used together. This is the issue that I will focus on in this session. As one of the solutions, I will show you how Submariner, a tool for cross-cluster connectivity, helps to solve this issue. As explained in the overview, I will first explain legacy requirement of identifying senders by using source IPs, then explain Kubernetes specification of unstable source IPs. After that, I will show what is Submariner and how it solves the issue, then show demo for it, and finally conclude. Let me start with legacy requirement of identifying senders by using source IPs. IP address 
has been used as an identity of sender, especially in the legacy world. Example use cases are firewall, ACL for software, and identifying sender of application. I will explain these use cases a bit more in detail in the next slides. However, let me continue explanation on the drawback of using source IPs for these use cases. Actually, IP address isn't always unique, but it is practically used as an identity with workarounds. For example, technologies like Dynamic NAT or NAPT is used to avoid IPv4 address exertion. It provides one-to-end mapping for IP addresses, therefore, it will lose uniqueness. On the other hand, one-to-one -one static NAT provides uniqueness, so it can be used to avoid this case. Virtual IPs, like Elastic IP, are widely used. It won't be unique when reused and especially when used for ephemeral entity. However, we may be able to avoid using virtual IPs as a workaround when there is a requirement for stable source IPs. I will briefly explain use cases for stable and unique source IPs. First use case is firewall. Firewalls may exist on OS or in network boundary as described in the diagram. It blocks by using combination of source IP, port, protocol, and so on to only allow the certain set of system to access to the certain set of system to avoid malicious access. When adding new systems, these firewalls rules will need to be updated, but it requires that source IPs are stable and unique, at least in certain ranges of IPs. Second use case is ACL for software. Software like database has their own ACL to only allow specific IPs to connect to it. It is similar to firewall use case, but it is done by software side. The third use case is identifying sender of application. Some software uses source IP to uniquely identify sender or send back later. For example, the diagram shows that server distinguishes client A and client B by using sender's source IP. While the connection from client it's kept, server can send back to the client. However, if the server would like to send packet back later after the connection is lost, the server would need to reconnect to the client. In such a use case, using source IP will be the easiest implementation. Next topic is Kubernetes specification of unstable source IPs. Kubernetes has a strict network model because it leverages CNI or Container Network Interface to make the backend of the network functionality pluggable. Thanks to the network model and CNI, in Kubernetes, we can choose a variety of CNI plugins without worrying about 
the implementation difference. All the guaranteed behaviors of the Kubernetes network should be defined here. So let's go through the Kubernetes network model to see what and how it is defined. There are three definitions. Let's see one by one and map each of them to the diagram. The first one is about pod-to-pod -pod communication. It defines that pods on one node can communicate with all pods on all nodes without NAT. Pods share a virtual network even when they are deployed on different hosts. There are two points. If we focus on the sacred pod in the middle, they can be marked as described. The pod can communicate with the pod in the same node without NAT, and the pod can also communicate with the pods in the different nodes without NAT. So source IPs will be stable for this kind of communication. The second one is about agent to pod communication on a node. It defines that agents on one node can communicate with all pods on that node. It only defines the behavior inside each node. There is only one point. If we focus on the sacred kubelet in the middle, it can be marked as described. The agent, like kubelet, can communicate with all the pods in the same node. The third one, is about pod to pod communication. It is similar to the first one, but it is for pod in host network. Kubernetes can assign host network to pods as described in the sacred pod. Definition of network model goes like this. Pods in the host network of a node can communicate with all pods on all nodes without NAT. So even in the host network case, the pod can communicate with the pod in the same node without NAT, and the pod can also communicate with the pods in different nodes without NAT. From the previous slides, I copied all the marks to the diagram in this slide. So it should show all the defined connections in the Kubernetes network model. Let's compare it and connection to outside Kubernetes cluster. If we add non-cluster server to the diagram, source IPs when going into Kubernetes cluster and source IPs when going out from Kubernetes cluster are like these. We can see that both of these connections are not defined in the Kubernetes model. So it depends on the implementation of each CNI plugin. In most plugins, these source IPs, when going out from Kubernetes cluster, is either nutted with node IP or pod IP, which may change across pod listers. As a result, we are now sure that source IPs are unstable and might not be unique 
when they go into Kubernetes cluster or go out from Kubernetes cluster. With these in mind, I had a discussion in Kubernetes community in the Kubernetes Enhancement Proposal, or CAP. As a result of discussion in the Kubernetes community, more extreme use case to connect beyond the same network was found. The example in the previous slides is just talking about the Kubernetes deployed in the same network to the existing systems. But this use case is about deploying Kubernetes cluster in a different network, even in another cloud connected via the internet. So we need to handle wider scope. Also, for implementation, it is asked to be implemented outside the core Kubernetes. It will be a fair decision that implementing it in core Kubernetes would break the existing Kubernetes network model, which would lead to break existing CNI plugins. Now, we understand what is the issue. Let's move on to how we solve it. Sabrina is used to solve the issue. So let me explain what is Sabrina first and continue how it solves the issue. Submariner is a tool built to connect over networks of different Kubernetes clusters. It can connect Kubernetes clusters in a different network. Networks can be in other clouds, even over internet. You can connect more than two Kubernetes clusters. You can communicate from a pod in one Kubernetes cluster to a pod in another Kubernetes cluster, almost as if it is in the same Kubernetes cluster, like accessing peer service. That is not a road balancer service. This is a very rough summary of how Sabrina works. It only explains what is needed to explain the rest of this presentation. So if you are interested in the details, I recommend you to check existing Submariner presentations or website. Submariner makes one of the nodes in each cluster a gateway node, as described in the diagram. So there is one gateway node for cross-cluster connection in each Kubernetes cluster. It uses VX run tunnel to connect a pod or service, as described in the blue lines in the diagram. Also, it uses IPsec tunnel to connect the gateway between the clusters, as described in the green line in the diagram. So, the pod in the on-premise cluster sends a packet to the gateway in the cluster to connect to the pod in another cluster. Then, the packet go all the way through the green line from the gateway in the on-premise to the one in the cloud. And finally, the packet comes from the gateway to the service in the cluster and word it to the pod. In normal mode, pod IPs and service IPs are used as they are, so no overlapping CIDR is allowed. Because if CIDR overlaps, Submariner can't decide if the packets are for the cluster 
or the other cluster. To allow overlapping cider between clusters, global net feature exists in Sabrina. Global net controller assigns a global IP to an exported service. Global IP is a kind of virtual IP that can be used across clusters. Global net controller keeps a rule to forward a packet to the corresponding service. So, the part in the on-premise cluster can access to the service in the cluster in the cloud via global IP. Global IP can be regarded as a stable IP address across clusters. As you can see, Submarine provides features to connect different network across internet and provide a stable IP address. So let's see how we can apply it to our outside cluster use cases. This slide shows the basic idea to apply Submarina to external network use case. The diagram in this slide describes from non-cluster to cluster connection, and the one in the next slide will show the reverse direction. First step is to prepare an all-in-one Kubernetes cluster to connect from non-cluster server as a gateway. This cluster is only used to be a gateway to other clusters, so it is not intended to put some workloads. In non-cluster server, we will add a routing rule to send to the all remote cluster for global IP subnet. So all the packets to the global IP from non-cluster server will be sent to the gateway in all-in-one Kubernetes cluster. As a result, non-cluster server can access to the service in the cluster in the cloud via global IP. Also, for access from cluster to non-cluster, service wizard selector can be used in all-in-one Kubernetes cluster to assign global IP to non-cluster servers. The access from the pod in the cluster in the cloud will be done via the service in the all-in-one Kubernetes cluster. You might not familiar with the concepts like service with a selector, so I will explain a bit about it in the next slide. Service with a selector is a way to make service an abstraction for other backend than pod. Normal service is a service with selectors as described in the diagram in the left hand side. It is used to allow pods to be accessed via cluster IP that is assigned to the service. Selector is used to filter out a specific set of pods that should be accessed via cluster IP. Kubernetes updates the set automatically by updating an endpoint for the service. On the other hand, the service with a selector is to allow access to non-cluster server via service from pods. Instead of specifying selectors 
to select a set of pods, users create and update endpoints by their selves manually to allow access from cluster IP. Next Kubernetes concept is headless service. Headless service is a service without load balancing via cluster IP. As explained, normal service is accessed via cluster IP, but headless service isn't load balanced by Kubernetes. It is often used with stateful set to provide a unique identity for each pod. Let's see the difference by using diagrams. In a normal service, if there are multiple pods backed by a service, it load balances to pod IPs from cluster IP and it adds a DNS entry for only cluster IP. In headless service, it doesn't provide a load balance and at a DNS entry for pod IPs. Also, it adds additional DNS entries that are prefixed with pod name to identically access to each pod. To achieve the same access for headless service with GlobalNet, we need some considerations. For normal service, global IP is assigned to each service. But for headless service, global IP is assigned to each pod. Let's see the difference in the diagram. For normal service, backend pods are load balanced via global IP, so the global IP is assigned to the service, and the DNS entry is replaced to the global IP. For headless service, backend pods are not load balanced, so we need to provide a way to access directly pod via global IPs. So global IP needs to be assigned to each pod and TNS entry are replaced to each global IP for pods. Final configuration for external network connectivity with Submariner goes like this diagram. For external to cluster connectivity, headless service and stateful set should be used. Submariner version 0.10 or later supports headless service with global net. For cluster to external access, service without selector should be used. Actually, headless service without selector is needed to make source IP unique, but not supported yet as of version 0.11, and it is still under discussion. So, Currently, what we can do is just use service without selector. As a result, one direction of access, source IP is global IP, but not unique. Now that we've covered the theory, let's see it in action. Let's first see the demo environment. There are three servers running in the same network. Test VM is a non-cluster server used to test access 
to Kubernetes cluster. Cluster A is an all-in-one Kubernetes that is used as a gateway from test VM. Cluster B is a Kubernetes cluster that will be connected from test VM with stable source IP. Cluster A and cluster B are connected by using Sabrinar with GlobalNet feature enabled. Test VM is configured to have a routing rule to use cluster A as a gateway for GlobalNet subnet. For DNS resolution for test VM, DNS server is configured in cluster A and referenced from cluster, oh, sorry, test VM. In this demo, cluster B is also an all-in-one Kubernetes and exists in the same network to the test VM. However, it can be multiple node cluster and exist in other network. Okay, so let's check cluster A and cluster B first. We can see that cluster A is a single node cluster with 26 IP, and cluster B is also a single node cluster with 27 IP. Next, let's check that they are connected by using Submariner. Subculture show all command shows that cluster A is connected with cluster B and the same command for cluster B will show that it is also connected with cluster A by using Submariner. And let's check that we deployed DNS server in cluster A. It is deployed as a deployment and exposed to allow access from external server as 251 of 242 segment. Let's check that test VM is running 142 IP and routing table is set to cluster A IP for global net IPs and the resolve conf is configured to point to the DN server in cluster A. And uh, we can access to the DN server and Finally, let's deploy HTTP server on test VM to test access from Kubernetes cluster. Then, let's deploy state of set web in cluster B. It is configured to have two replica, web0 and web1. We'll expose the state of set with headless service, engine XSS. Then export the service to allow access via global IP. For allowing access to test VM, we will create service wizard selector in cluster A and create an endpoint to point to test VM. Then also export the service to allow access via global IP. Let's try in the actual environment. First, in cluster B, we will deploy stateful set web with two replicas we will expose it with headless service engine XSS. 
stateful set and service exist, then export the service to allow access via global IP. Then global IPs are assigned for port web0 and web1. For allow access to test VM, in cluster A, we will create service wizard selector test VM and create endpoints manually to point to the test VM. Then also check that service and endpoints exist and export service to assign global IP. Then global IP is assigned to test VM. Now that we are ready to test accesses, let's first test port to external connection. From port web0 and web1 that are managed by stateful set web, we will access to test VM via service test VM in cluster A. 253 IP is used to access to the test VM. Let's check the stateful set in cluster B. We have stateful set and two port managed by it. And first we will log into the port web0 and try access to 253 IP that is global IP for the test VM. And the access succeeds and the log shows that it is accessed from the port global IP. Next, let's try the same for port web1. Log into the web1 and try access to 253 IP and access succeeds and the log shows that it is accessed from Web1's global IP. Finally, we will test access from external to port connection. From test VM, we will access to port Web0 and Web1. As we configured DNS in test VM, the service can be resolved by DNS. Web0 and Web1 can be resolved and each of them is pointing to the global IP for each port. Also, access from test VM to each port will succeed. Due to lack of implementation in current Submariner, we use service wizard selector for test VM instead of headless service wizard selector. The source IP for these access are from global IPs but won't be unique. Let's first check DNS resolution in test VM. Engine XSS is resolved to global IP for both port and if prefixed with port name, it is resolved to each port global IP. Then we will check that there is no access yet to these ports. Okay. Let's try access to port web zero from test VM first. 
the access succeeds, and there should be access log only in web zero, and source IP should be global IP. Okay, so do the same to port web one. The access succeeds and access log in web one should be added. Source IP is global IP, but not the same one. In conclusion, as for problem statement, some legacy systems require stable source IPs to identify senders. Source IPs aren't stable when going into Kubernetes or going out from Kubernetes. Such legacy systems and Kubernetes clusters can't work together as they are. And as for idea for solution, Submariner is a tool to provide multi-cluster connectivity for Kubernetes clusters. To connect clusters that have overlapping CIDR, global net feature is available. Combination of global net and headless service, headless service wizard selector provides a stable source IP to Kubernetes cluster. As for current development status for Submariner, headless service with global net is supported in Submariner version 0.10 or later. Headless service with a selector with global net isn't supported yet as of Submariner version 0.11. We need more tests and feedback for this use case. In this slide, I'm sharing related issues and PRs. Please check these URLs, try this feature, and give feedback if you are interested in this use case. The second to last URL is the one for missing feature. And the last URL shows how you can try this feature as shown in the demo. Other links are all discussions that will be useful to know the more detailed background and implementation around this feature. That's all and Thank you very much for your attention.